Okay, it looks like a lot to preachers and Bible teachers. Somebody read verse 17, please. A wicked mess messenger falls into trouble, but a trustworthy envoy brings healing. Yes. So how does this apply to anyone who is going to, I don't know, preach or teach the Bible? Essentially, you're bringing a message. What does this suggest? Well, I, maybe I should restate the question. Does this only apply to preachers and teachers, like this question suggests? It, no, it doesn't say that. It, it, it says a messenger, right? Isn't that what it describes? Well, a messenger is someone that carries a message, right? What is uh, the gospel? Um, yeah, is it not the good news? By the way, what is news? Is that not a message of some sort? Is that not something that, uh, it, yeah, isn't that something that a messenger would bring? And maybe today we use the internet a little bit more than, you know, the, the kid throwing a bicycle, bicycle throwing it or whatever. But it is the message. So the messenger, I really love the, the connection he's pointing out here because I think it's quite crucial. A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a trustworthy envoy brings healing. Every single one of us has been given this amazing message, this wonderful message of salvation. It's, it is the good news. And, and by the way, when we say the gospel, that is what the word gospel means. It means good news. So it immediately kind of begs the question, okay, good news. What is the good news? So how would you specifically answer that? What is this good news? It is the word of God. And what specifically about the word of God is good news? Because there's some pretty negative parts in there. <laughs> salvation through Jesus Christ. Yes, salvation through, made possible by Jesus Christ. How was it made possible by Jesus Christ? Because he emptied himself, you know, even though he was fully God, he came down as a man, emptied himself, and died a death that paid for our sins and the sins of the whole world potentially. Yeah, that is the good news. That is the message that we bring. And, and all throughout the Bible it talks about, even in Romans, I believe the 13th chapter, it, it says how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Um, uh, this message is a wonderful thing, but it applies very well right here because we're not talking about the message, we're talking about the messenger. A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a trustworthy envoy brings healing. If you are, how would you say this applies in the real world? Have, <coughs> has anyone ever observed something like this happen, where a wicked messenger got themselves into trouble? Not necessarily because of the message, but it was the messenger. That's how I think. What's his name? Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good point. Um, a preacher, you mentioned the name of a preacher that basically gave into, a, I believe it was a sexual sin. Uh, but there are others that embezzle money or something like that. That's a good example, right? Because when we mention their names, is the first thing that we think of, oh, yeah, um, that wonderful sermon they taught about repentance spoke to me or you know have you is that the first thought you have oh yeah he preached this great funeral sermon one time no probably the first thought you think is oh yeah that's the guy that ran off with so and so or, oh that's the guy that stole this much money or that's the guy that's trying to get this much money to build his you know to buy his jet so that he can go fly around or whatever you know uh, a lot of focus gets put on the messenger now 
in our day and age, um, because this is this is scripture, but it also is it, trying. We're trying to focus towards leadership here too. Uh, we do need to be aware, and, and I like to bring this up occasionally, not to be nitpicky, I just want you to know that, but <clears throat> there's been a change that has kind of taken place across the uh, evangelical planet, I guess, or at least I've seen it more so now in the Christian churches, and that is the guy that preaches on Sunday mornings is typically being referred to as the pastor, and kind of by default, Every other position, like, oh, if you're the guy that's in charge of youth, that means you're a youth pastor. Or if you're this, you know, you're in charge of the children, you're the children's pastor. Or, you know, things like that. It's kind of become that. Um, the reason why I'm bringing this up is, number one, scripturally, what is a pastor in the Bible? A shepherd. A shepherd, yes, exactly. They work hand in hand, obviously, with deacons in the church. But it is one of the elders who are commissioned to take care of the church. It is, and it is never a single individual either. It is a group, and that's pretty smart, right? That, that definitely cuts down on uh, this bad, uh, you know, one guy can make a mistake or wasn't, wasn't thinking clearly. Uh, having a plurality makes good sense. But we've kind of shifted a little bit to, in our terms, that's not always a bad thing because words do change meaning. I've, I've said words before, and then youth group kids are like, you said that? I'm like, what? Yeah. So this, don't say that. Why? Well, because it's a bad word now, and I didn't know that. If you had that happen to you, by the way, if you said one of those things that it turned into a bad word, and I hate it too, because there are some words that, um, you know, growing up, uh, I used the word queer a lot because <laughs> things were just strange to me, and I just loved the, the flow of this word. And then I crossed a day where I just couldn't say my word anymore because people didn't understand it the way I wanted them to. And so many other, you know, things like that happen. Well, unfortunately, this term pastor has kind of undergone a change and, and is instead being used of the person leading the church. Well, what has happened as a result, I think, this is kind of my assessment, is that a lot of churches have kind of propped up this position of a preacher, elder, man that runs this thing. Uh, kind of a leader slash mini dictator, not really bad but you know what I mean they have they have elevated someone to a position that isn't exactly in line with scripture and as a result what that person says and what that person does matters to everyone um, and unfortunately some people might be uh, might get a bad taste in their mouth about Christianity because a leader a pastor uh, is seen doing something they shouldn't do, being hypocritical, and it puts a bad spotlight. Well, that's one of the reasons why if you uh, try to stick with what the Bible says, which is a real goal that we have here, that's that's why uh, those of us that work here, we don't go around saying I'm the pastor of this or whatever, because we already have elders, and they perform their job as shepherding, which is what they do. Um, so uh, somebody like me or somebody like my dad, he's probably going to say I'm an evangelist, because that is the scriptural term. It's more in line with what he does as far as preaching that good news. Um, so we try to keep that so that we can avoid some of this, because these are biblical safeguards to avoid the problem that you have with messengers. Now, even with those biblical safeguards, you still get into trouble. People, what is it? People don't care what you know until they know how much you care. Your character, your actions speak so much louder than your actual words do. Um, so what we have to be thinking about is as we are all messengers of Christ proclaiming the good news, I've got to ask you, are you proclaiming the good news? And you say, well, yeah, I was talking to somebody the other day, you know, or I, I'm quick to point out that I'm a Christian and I'll explain this is what Christianity is it's Jesus died for my for our sins he sacrificed no that's great I understand that but I'm asking are you proclaiming the good news when people look at you do you look like someone that Jesus Christ died for and now you live with purpose you're saved and you want the world to know about it do you make your decisions based on that criteria do you act like this person that you claim to be outwardly? 
See, there can be a discrepancy between the messenger and the message. And if there is, I think more often than not, people are looking at your character more than your words. And so we've got to make sure what we put out there, not just with our words, but what we are doing, how we handle frustration, how we, how we are seen when we think people aren't watching, but they really are. Are we proclaiming the message in those times, during those things? Uh, I mention that because I, I have this habit of complaining sometimes. And it's at those moments that I wonder, like, hmm, is that proclaiming the message of Christ? You know, yeah, Jesus died for me. I, I have heaven to look forward to, you know? And as a result of heaven, uh, I, I'm going to be in this place where there's no more pain. I'm going to be around all these people I love. I live a life of purpose. That's never going to stop. But man, it's hot outside. The temperature? I mean, it's brutal. It's terrible. <laughs> Unbelievable. You know what I mean? Like, who would want to live here? <laughs> and it can ruin my day, by the way. Um, but why? Why? Do, what am I communicating? A, a mixed message here. All right, I'm, I'm speaking too much to myself, so I'm moving on. Um, number seven. Why is it important for us to... Why is it important for us to choose our companions carefully? Chapter 13, verse 20. He who walks with the wise grow wise, grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Why is it important to choose our companions carefully? You become who you hang out with. You become who you hang out with. A wise person I knew uh, used to make this claim. He said, hey, show me who your friends are, and I'll show you who you will be like in the next five years or so. Because it is true, you tend to become like the people that you hang out with. Have you observed this? Um, man, I observe this in some of the strangest of ways. It, it drives me crazy because some people uh, that I just ended up spending more time with, they say things a certain way, and then one day I'll catch myself using a phrase, like, why did I say that? <laughs> if you hang around a certain demographic, for a while, it used to be, do you remember when it was awkward, and maybe for you it still is, but you remember when it was awkward for someone to like every like time like they said like in their conversation? Like, remember when that was awkward? And I've crossed a threshold to where I probably don't even know it anymore. I'm just like, yeah, like I know, like I understand, yeah, like yeah, yeah. And, and it's just with me. But how many people are like me looking back and saying, what is wrong with you? You know, is the English language is just too challenging for you. And then it changes to literally. We always say literally before everything. Like, why is it nobody figuratively does anything? They always say literally. I literally went to this podium and I literally read another verse. Well, that's just, a, some people will start saying that and I, I will make fun of it. And then I will literally say it the next moment. Because you tend to become like the people that you're around. And you just cannot change that fact. Um, this should be enough. There's more scripture to back up this idea. But this should be enough for us to know who we should and shouldn't marry. This alone should be enough to know who we should have as our closest friends and who we shouldn't, right? Um, think what if their core worldview, if their core beliefs are going to differ, uh, is that the kind of influence you should be spending your time around? We're not saying they're a terrible person. We're not saying that. But is that what you're trying to become or not? He who walks with the wise grows wise, uh, unlike the companion of fools who suffers harm. So got to choose our company carefully. Um, man, uh, I'm tempted to afterwards, if one of you thinks of an uh, uh, illustration of this in your own life, I would be tempted to hear it because uh, um, more often than not, in the time I spent doing youth ministry stuff, I would observe people that these bad friends just didn't seem like a big deal to them. And it's always sometime later on in life, if they do, they come back and they say, wow, yeah, I was in with the wrong crowd and that ruined me. Time and time again I hear that, and I'm sure you've got some stories of that too that we need to hear. Okay, uh, let's move on. Question number eight. How does chapter 13, verse 22 encourage thrift and conservation? Mm -hmm. 
good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Mm. So how is this encouraging us to conserve some of what we have? What does it say? A good, a good person does what? He leaves an inheritance for who? His children's children. Do you realize how hard it is to leave an inheritance for your children? <laughs> you know, you know, but this says, man, you, you do it for your children's children. How on earth are we supposed to do that? The only way I know to do this right now is, and I may have even told my daughter this already, but I'm like, Hattie, you've already inherited all kinds of national debt. That's on you. And I'm passing it down to you, and it's already getting passed down to your kids probably too. So that's an inheritance. Uh, but that's a... So how on earth are you going to do this? Well, I think this passage is speaking primarily. I mean, it is the obvious here. You should be uh, not blowing everything on yourself. Uh, you should live with more purpose than that. And that's what a good person would do, obviously. But if you find yourself in the uh, camp where you just don't think you're, I don't know, you're money challenged perhaps, it just doesn't come as easily as it does for others, is there anything else you leave for your children or your children's children? It should be your relationship with God. I would hope so. Can you guys think of any examples today where the only reason he or she went to church was because, oh yeah, my grandmother, oh yeah, my grandfather, you know, or she made me come to church. I've heard that story time and time again. And a number of those kids are in church now, committed Christians now. And I'd be willing to bet that somebody left an inheritance for their children's children. Like what you were saying. They made a difference. Um, sometimes it's the memories that you choose to make. Uh, I believe it was Roger Chambers that made this statement. I heard about it from Aaron Chambers. But uh, one, of, um, one of Aaron Chambers, I believe it was his dad, so Roger Chambers' sayings would be, be where the being is. That was his constant expression, be where the being is. And I like that when you think about it, because there's a lot of times where I'm like, okay, yeah, I realize we have a family moment, and that's good, but something urgent's come up, or I can't get this fixed, and I can't put this down, because if I put it down, I will not get it fixed, you know, in the next five minutes, whatever. These things are always going to come up. There's always going to be things that have to get done. We know this, so why not be where the being is? When there's a moment happening, it's sort of like those, in youth group, it was the campfire moments. You know, I've been teaching all these lessons that should have taught you everything you need to know and really spoke to you, but I only get sincere, earnest questions when it's late and we're sitting around a campfire and I'm half asleep. And then somebody's like, hmm, what about this? Is this a sin? Should I be living this way? Like, what? You're asking me this now? <laughs> Two thoughts go through my head. Number one is, I've been teaching about this forever. How on earth do you not know that? <laughs> then number two is like, well, I'm glad they're finally <laughs> answering. I just hope I can wake up and not mess up the answer and blow an opportunity. So uh, you, there's more than one way to leave an inheritance. However, I did a while ago calculate, and I, I'm going to mess this up because I don't have the numbers in front of me, but if you could, at a modest interest rate, invest $1 and just get it to stay for 200 years, do you realize how much that dollar is going to become? Well, with inflation, maybe nothing. But barring that aside, I may not even be legal that. <laughs> barring some of these probably foreseen circumstances, mm -hmm. uh, millions, it would turn into millions of dollars. And so I just thought, man, what if we all started this crazy idea right here, right now? We all put a dollar away for our kids, 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 and we made the next generation do which we would never actually make this happen, but if you did, we'd all be so rich. It's just letting time work for you. Anyway, it's being smart. And some of those things, you, they are time sensitive. Your kids grow up, even mine do. Um, and you can't undo some of those things that you missed out on, so you don't want to miss out on. Um, what instruction do we receive about disciplining our children in 1324? Oh, yeah, good stuff right here. Good stuff. He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline. 
He who spares what? Hates his son? The rod. The rod. Is this saying that you need to use, a, 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 is the instrument kind of the focus here, you need to use a particular rod? Maybe on some. <laughs> I don't think that is necessarily the focus, but the rod is obviously symbolic of something that kind of hurts a bit, something that's not going to be so pleasant. My uncle, as I understand it for his kids, he, um, I'm not saying I endorse this particular thing, <laughs> I'm going to keep that in mind, but he had a literal rod of discipline that he kept up, and he called it that, and he kept it up in a certain place, so. And I think he used it for some of the scare tactics, a little bit of a, I'm just gonna walk over to my rod. <laughs> <laughs> Kids would straighten right up real fast. So, yeah. I think with the rod, there's another side to that where shepherds used a rod. They didn't always, like, beat the sheep, but they guided them. Oh, a shepherd's rod. rod. So that's cool. Guiding is important. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because I do think that's an important point to be made as well. Um, the main, I do think the primary context here is going to be discipline because the second part of the verse, he who loves him is careful to discipline him. Um, I would like to challenge us though on the first part of this verse and I think you guys are agreeing with me here probably but he who spares the rod hates his son he who and we'll, we'll take the rod for what it's talking about here like you said discipline and discipline can be positive or negative obviously he who holds back discipline hates his son I thought parents I thought a lot of parents you talk to that aren't doing a great job of disciplining their kids it's because they can't, they don't want to hurt them. They love their kids so much. They can't imagine torturing them, you know? But what does God's word say about that? No, you, and this is a hard thing to say, but I'm sorry, you do not love your kids the way you should. If you really love them, you would discipline them. I think and, it's into the, the heart. They can use the heart logic versus the head logic, you know, can be deceiving. Or, you know, I just love them so much I couldn't do that to them. But. Yeah, because it hurts. Yeah. It hurts. And then we apply that even further to our Heavenly Father, and that confuses people even more. Because how could a loving God allow discipline in our lives? How is Hebrews, the 12th chapter in the Bible, where God disciplines people that he loves? What? But if you've got this thing down properly, discipline is important. And the way somebody put it, I kind of liked I think it's helpful. He said the worst, kind, in his opinion at least, the worst kind of child abuse that he knows of, and he may be overstating this point, but nonetheless, one of the worst types of child abuse that he knows of is allowing a child to grow up a brat, entitled, completely undisciplined, and people will never want to be around him. That is, that is a form of, that's a form of abuse to a child. He needs to be formed. She needs to be formed properly and lovingly. Now, what does the New Testament say about this discipline thing? Is there anything that tells us not to get carried away with it in the New Testament? Are we allowed to say, oh, I just, if there's a problem with my kid, pull out the rod, beat him a few more times, and then we're good. <laughs> Is that the biblical formula here or no? It's not. Why not? What does the scripture say about that? It says, fathers, do not do what to your kids? You remember? Oh. Provoke, yeah, or exasperate them, but bring them up. Why did it say fathers, too? Is that, <laughs> what's up with that? Um, yeah, hitting us where it hurts, I guess. But we need to be careful. It has to be appropriate. And sometimes I, I, would, I would agree it's not always appropriate. If, if you find a method of discipline that's not working, maybe you should rethink it to something that is, perhaps. Um, but... Something else that the, that this verse says, uh, <laughs> he who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. What does your version say for the last part of that verse, careful to discipline him? Anyone have anything different? Who loves? Diligent. Points. Diligent to discipline him? Okay. NIV says careful, careful. to discipline him. Careful? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Well, 
in the Hebrew, it uses the term that you could literally translate searches out for discipline. Mm -hmm. Searches out for discipline. Man, now we're looking like a real jerk now. Because <laughs> we already, you know, you spare the rod, you hate your son, but he who searches out. So what are you, that parent, that parent that goes spying on your kids? I'm going to mess up Break out the rod of discipline. <laughs> Is that the kind of, by the way, uh, did you know not that long ago, a, uh, a, it was a parent, I don't know if it was a mom or a dad, probably a dad, he got in trouble because he, he was a, uh, spying on his kids at school with one of those remote control like uh, <laughs> helicopters yeah. videotaping his kids you heard of the helicopter parents well that just became a literal thing according to this guy yeah uh, I don't think that's exactly what we're talking about here so we're not talking about someone that's just I can't wait to give a beat down or whatever um, even though maybe I want to joke with my kids and make them think that no, I'm just kidding, I don't. but what do we mean then? What is good? What is loving about searching out discipline? Is there anything loving about that? Does this mean you're not looking for positive things? You are looking for positive things. Every time, I'm pretty sure it's not a good idea for mom or dad to every time they look at you and you make eye contact for you to think, uh-oh, I'm in trouble for something. That's the only reason mom or dad looks at me. No, that is not what we want. So why is it searching out for discipline is a good idea? Depending on how harsh you would need to take your discipline, whether it would be talking or, you know, more of a reprimand or... Ooh, an you know, to give an appropriate response for the situation kind of implies that you know a little bit about them in the situation. That's a good point. Well, if you're searching it out, I mean, you're paying attention to them. You're paying attention you're, to your kids? Yeah. Like you're responsible for them? Yeah, you're, you're responsible. You're actively, actively watching what they're doing. I mean, there's some parents that just turn their kids loose and, yeah, you know, they have no idea what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think Scripture is, is pretty well telling us that. There are some situations where, yes, you give them appropriate freedom, but only what they're ready for. You guys understand this in the weightlifting world we don't start the guy off with a 400 pound you know set of weights and say lift this first and then we're moving up from here you could do some real damage to somebody if you did that you build up strength incrementally we develop that way too don't we in, in all areas of our life we develop gradually so how bad can it be to throw a load on us that we maybe never been prepared to take care of um, <coughs> And I've talked about this before. I trust you guys know this already. But every single person, um, <clears throat> pretty much every single person who has a phone has an unlimited access to uh, massive amounts of pornography. Uh, completely, uh, you know, it's there. It can be spotted by you. Nobody else knows about it. There are easy ways to keep it concealed from parents. And that's if your kid has a phone, you think, well, I'm one of the lucky ones, I won't let my child have a phone or whatever. That's great. I hope he's not friends with someone that does. Because <laughs> if he's friends with someone that has that, they have unlimited, and to me, this is kind of a difference. Um, the realm, the society that we're living in today has never had access to something this addictive so easily, so, so widespread. And the kids know how to use it so much better than the parents do. The, the kids know it. You know, if you have trouble with your phone, give it to a little kid. He'll fix it for you, you know. <laughs> um, but it, it makes a danger for us. If we don't search a little bit, if we don't look, even some parents, we know this, will not even entertain the idea that their little child could ever do anything wrong and a whole a terrible thing. But let's assume we're past that. Even though we're past that, yes, we respect them. Yes, we give them a degree of space as they develop. But you do not owe them any right to privacy. By the way, in the Discipleship Academy that we are running here, our college students don't even get a right to privacy.